As a class, Australian squatters, that is, station owners, must be counted among the most hospitable and open-hearted in the world and visiting the various stations to divine for water was a most delightful experience. After finishing my work on one property close to the mountains in the south of New South Wales, the young owner and his wife asked me whether I would like to see Mount Kosciuszko, familiar negation early known as Corsi, 7,328 feet, the highest mountain in Australia and the centre of the winter sports. The road to Kosciuszko ran through my host's property. While we were motoring along, I suddenly got a violent stab of pain through my feet, which I always gel, even in a car, when passing over gold or other minerals. I let out a yell which scared my poor hostess but left her husband quite undisturbed, for by now he was growing accustomed to my somewhat unas negation yule methods of divining. However, he made a mental note of the spot for future use. As soon as I had taken my departure for my headquarters in Sydney, my host acquired a boring plant and set to work to test the water locations which I had marked. I had done most of the work on a large-scale map before visiting the prop negationity, so all I had to do on the actual ground was checking up and pinpointing the spots and analysing the underground water for purity, depth and yield, which he had not seen done before. So, he waited to see whether my water findings were successful before investigating the reason for my yell. As everything worked out according to plan, he wrote and asked me to visit the station again and prospect for gold at the spot which had nearly shot me through the roof of the car. As I was anxious to try my hand at divining for gold and had enjoyed my previous stay with the young couple, I gladly accepted. In a country like Australia, where properties often cover hundreds of square miles, any form of divining which meant walking over the ground, would be impossible. But, by putting a large-scale map on a table in one's own home and drawing the underground streams on it, one can survey 100 square miles as easily as 20 acres. If the places marked on the map are accurately measured by a train surveyor and those measurements are equally accurately transferred to the ground, I do not expect the marked spots to be more than a few feet, or even inches, out when I test them, no matter how far away from the place I might have been when I drew the Parsi negation tunes on the map. Distance makes no difference. My initiation into gold divining in Australia was beset with many difficulties, despite the assistance given by my map. The country was all low foothills covered with scrub, and the gold veins were in slate, instead of quartz, not unusual in that nay negation behood where several gold mines were already working, but which made things harder for me, since it was the first time I had worked under such conditions. A lot of hard work was done, and a number of fairly promising spots were marked, especially the one crossing the road, which had given me such a shock in the car. But, on the whole, the results were disappointing, as we were hoping for something really big. Finally, we decided to try another place about 50 miles away, where quantities of alluvial gold had been obtained by Italians before the war. This lay almost at the foot of Kosciuszko. It is an area known as Snowy Plains, which is let on leases to sheep farm negation errs, who take their flocks there in the summer to allow portions of their own stations to rest and go fallow. The alluvial gold had been found on land let to a farmer living on the edge of my host's property. Every year, he and his son, Ray, six feet three in his socks, and as handsome as a picture, took their sheep over the hills to the snowy plains block where we were to go. As autumn was approaching, we decided to start without delay, but much was to happen before we finally set off for the mountain to join the sheep. An urgent family matter called my hostess to Sydney, and her husband had to drive her to the railway station, 30 miles away, leaving me with a station hand and his wife and child. After going out to the garage to say goodbye to my hostess, I stopped to look at the hills at the back of the house, which always afforded me much pleasure with their changing colours and beauty. But there were no hills. A thick, white impenetrable sheet met my gaze as if some giantess had hung out her weekly washing. I could scarcely believe my eyes. N negation entirely mystified, I returned to my part of the house, which was in a new wing, and tried to read. It was very hot, and thunder had been rumbling all the afternoon. Suddenly, without any warning, the rain descended. It poured. Then there was a deluge and finally the bottom fell out of the celestial reservoir and the whole contents came down at once. 
I went through to the old part of the house to find the man and his wife Fran Negation tickily trying to stem a river which seemed to be pouring in at the back of the house and rushing out of the front. The house was built under the hills, with a huge catchment area above. A little below there was a flat covered with fruit trees and be negation yond at a tiny creek. The house was built of wood and part of it was very old. I had often amused myself by walking round it and pressing my thumb against the timbers to see whether it would go through. It always did and how it survived this deluge was a miracle. Then, with the same dramatic sudden negation ness, down came the hail, with a terrific noise on the Karoo negation gated iron roof, which all the houses in Australia seemed to have. I left the man and his wife frantically stuffing mats under doors to try to stop the flood and returned to my own court negation urs where, with the exception of two very large leaks, all was well. The heat was awful, so, hail or no hail, I threw open the door, which overlooked the little flat and the creek below. Then I heard a curious noise, a dull sickening sort of a roar, that I can only liken to the roar of an approaching earthquake. But, as serious earthquakes are practically unknown in Osnegation Tralia, I knew it couldn't be that. Then pandemonium broke loose. The gentle little rippling creek had become a wall of dirty brown water, ten or fifteen feet high, carrying all before it. The big willow trees growing along its banks were washed out of the ground and the noise of their falling trunks and snapping boughs was like that of a forest fire. The trees went hurtling down the roaring flood, mixed up with drowning cattle and sheep and great boulders rolled along like pebbles, while the thunder never ceased and the blinding flashes of lightning added to the nightmare of horror. When the hail had stopped and the storm had somewhat abated, we all donned gum boots and waded out to ascertain the extent of the damage. Even walking down the sloping drive, we had to hold on to each other to keep our feet in the torrents of water still rushing down from the hills which must have been the real centre of, he cloud burst. We saved several groups of marooned and terrified sheep by making them swim and driving them to higher ground and then made our way to the creek, which was covered with great waves like the waves of the sea. And what a terrible sight! There were dead sheep everywhere. Some caught in the boughs of the few remaining trees, others draped round stumps and boulders on the creek's banks, or being hurled down the boiling flood, mixed with the corpses of other animals in endless succession. We were a sad little group as we made our way back to the very wet house. My host had to spend the night in his car on the other side of the creek and next day, discovered that he had lost several miles of fencing, besides much of his valuable stock. It was my first experience of a creek in flood, and I sincerely hope it will be my last. All this delayed our departure for the gold field. It was nearly a week before it was considered safe for us to travel without a risk of getting bogged. We finally arranged to go on a Sunday and were to leave about noon, as we had fifty miles of very rough country to cover. I sat and watched the truck being packed with much interrogation est, it seemed to include everything we could possibly need as if we were off to a desert island. At last, everything was covered with a tarpaulin, and we set off. We all grumbled incessantly at the condition of the roads, which were crevassed with washaways, forcing us to continually slow down, but they appeared almost perfect on our return journey, after what we had been through in the meantime. The difficult part of our journey began after we had gone about ten miles, when we dropped down to a river and began to climb the other side. The climb must have been nearly one thousand feet, with the track getting worse at every twist and tum. Near the top, when the car was nearly boiling, the track became a series of ridges of sharp upturned slate, and we just bumped from one to die other. I must admit that I was glad when they were behind us. However, in a few minutes we reached the top and came into the real snow country. Here the scrub gave place to some of the loveliest trees which I have seen in any part of Dai world. It would take the pen of a poet to describe them in all their beauty, with their silvery trunks and boughs, which keep their unsullied freshness by shedding their bark each year, as a snake sloughs its skin. Their soft olive-green leaves seem fresher and more vivid than those of other gum trees. Their chief beauty is the wonderful scarlet color on the weather side of their trunks as if some great giant had painted them with a lavish hand to protect them from the snow and icy winds of winter. The effect of the setting sun on the scarlet and silver of the trees was awe-inspiring in its radiant beauty. 
we were indeed passing through one of nature's awe-inspiring cathedrals. Then we dropped down to the plains themselves, which were an immense green basin, many miles in extent, nestling among the surrounding hills. Our first glance, the whole basin looked like a lawn, all smooth and velvety, but it proved to be quite the reverse when we got there. We took a widely circuitous route across it to avoid the dreaded boggy spots, while endeavoring to find the ford across the river which traverses it. After crossing the river, we started to climb a grassy strip left as a stock route between two fences, when the car came to a standstill. There was an ominous squelching sound, which meant that we were bogged. And there we were, bogged in the blackest, oiliest mud I have ever seen. Both men descended and stood, ankle-deep in it, gazing at our disaster. When a car is bogged in this country everyone starts to dig it out. It is always a mystery to me why they do so, to my mind it should only make the car sink in deeper, and now as I thought of the tremendous load on the back of it, my heart sank with the car. Nevertheless, the two men pulled out the spades and started to dig. It was by no means the first time that I had been in a car which had broken down in the wilds of some country and I have received so many compliments from the men whom I have been with for being the only woman they knew who didn't interfere on such occasions, that I decided to say nothing and go to sleep. But I had reckoned without two things, mosquitoes, and smells. The mosquitoes in Australia have no manners. Instead of going to bed by day and appearing at night, they seem to be quite as vicious and hungry by both. And the black mud in which we were bogged was giving off the most horrible smell, which got worse and worse as the men dug, until I seriously meditated getting out of the car and jumping from tussock to tussock until I got to firm ground. But, when I saw the state of the men's boots and legs, I decided that even mosquitoes and smells were preferable to risking immersion in the bog. Also, I didn't much fancy the risk of meeting a herd of black Angus cattle, which had become wild from being left on the plains for several years. Several cows with calves had come close to the car while the men were digging, bellowing with rage at our intrusion into their peaceful solitude and, as there were certain to be bulls with the herd, I came to the conclusion that I was better off where I was. After about an hour's digging, chains were put on the wheels, the engine was started and with many prodigious jerks the car climbed the little ridge in front of us to safety but the last mile or two of our journey were the worst. We left the plains and crawled up the side of a trackless mountain. Here my host walked in front and there were many halts and consultations while trees were chopped down and boulders rolled out of the way to get the car through. Finally, we stopped again. This, said Ray, is our Mount Negation Tain hut. Where we are going to live? He pushed open the door and I followed him in. He looked round with an air of pride. It has stood here for over fifty years and, although perhaps it is nothing very grand, it is a pretty comfortable mountain hut. It was long and narrow, with a huge open hearth taking up one end, where all the cooking was done over an open log fire. The furniture consisted of a few boxes with wire gauze fronts in which to keep the tucker from the flies, which appeared in myriads with the sun each morning, a few wooden stools and a shelf table fixed to the wall under the window, which was merely a movable wooden shutter. In one corner was an Auden negation re bed, pushed up against a partition which reached about halfway up to the roof. In this partition was a door leading to the only bedroom, which was to be mine. Ray threw open the door and, for a moment, I stood aghast. The whole of this small space was filled with a dreadful bed, made of nothing but wood. It had a wooden frame with heavy wooden laths laid across it and, on the laths, there was an awful sack-like thing, which was alluded to as the mattress. This and a shelf against the wall were all the room contained. I now understood why my host had brought another bed in the heavily laden truck. As it was intended for my accommodation dation. The question was where to put the wooden horror, so I rather nervously suggested turning it on its side. That was done and, with a fearful clatter, the entire contraption fell to pieces on the floor. As Ray was to sleep in a lean-to, where the saddles were kept, on the other side of my outside wall, and entirely devoid of furniture. I nobly insisted that he should have it. He agreed but pressed me to keep the mattress, which I firmly refused. By now we were all pretty hungry, and as soon as the tucker boxes were brought in from the truck, we set to work to unpack them. 
There were many exclamations of horror when it was discovered that the wife of the station hand had not only left out most of the bread but also all the sugar, which Australians in the bush shovel into their black tea in great spoonfuls. There were also many other necessities missing, when one is out back. With an appalling journey to the nearest township, small deprivations, such as lack of matches, sugar, and flour be negation come catastrophes. Luckily Ray had a small tin of sugar and a bag of flour in his tucker box, and he undertook to make a damper, a flour paste, cooked on an iron plate, the Austro negation Leanne Bushman standby in the absence of bread, if the bread really ran out. After a strange meal, eaten on the shelf table, and washed down with floods of black tea, we decided it was time for bed, seeing that we had to be up at daybreak. One of the most trying things about prospecting for gold by divining is that one has to start work at sunrise. Unless one does, instead of getting the reaction for gold over the actual vein or alluvia. Deposit the rays seem to become deflected, and one can get as many as twelve phantom places or mirages, not one of which is over the actual gold deposit, although it may give the diviner all the required reactions. This fact was disnegation covered many years ago and is a difficulty which is experienced by practically all diviners. Why it should be so is unknown. My working tools for such an expedition are almost nil. The chief item being a zigzag piece of steel wire, which I can disnegation pen say with, if necessary, using instead my bare hands, although this is far more tiring. For the first day of any survey, I work with a small bottle held in my hands, containing some unsmelted pieces of the mineral for which I am divining. This tunes me into it and cuts out the reactions from any other mineral. Once I am tuned in. And this doesn't take long. I can dispense with the sample. So with the first streak of a chilly dawn breaking, we set off through the long grass soaked with dew. Jumped over a little creek and climbed a hill on the other side. It was a lovely morn negation ing in spite of the chill, and the queer birds in the treetops and the dainty snow gums delighted my human soul, while the quartz scattered on the ground rejoiced my gold prose peeling heart. The surveyors had already pegged the spots taken from my map. So I immediately set to work. First, I had to find and mark the exact position of the gold deposits, for the pegs were some negation times a foot or two out. Then I followed the edges of the deposits by using my zigzag tool and marked them by dragging my heel on the ground. One of the men followed me and made the lines deeper with a pick or sharp stick, as all modem divan negation ing must be clearly marked on the ground for future reference. I then stood over the middle of the deposit to register on my negation self, as my body is the real divining instrument, whether these reactions were strong or weak and how long each reaction lasted. To make no mistake, I hold my zigzag tool firmly in my hands and let it revolve, which it apparently does without any help from me. For example, it may revolve 48 times and stop. A flat stone is then found and the number 48 is scratched plainly on it. The stone is then placed on the spot where I was standing. Every spot pegged by the surveyor is treated in the same way. As they are the places which gave the best reactions on the map. The work is tedious and exhausting and requires the most meticulous care. The greater the amount of mineral the greater the reaction and, consequently, the greater the fatigue entailed. When all have been tested which may take several days, the spots giving the highest counts are marked with a cairn of stones, on the sheltered side of which the numbered stone is placed for future use. The indications of rich gold were as good on the ground as on the map. So with each cairn our spirits rose. When we stopped work to boil the billy and make some tea, we began to feel that an El Dorado was in sight and the black tea, tanged with the smoke of gum leaves, was like the nectar of the gods. But the time for work is all too short in the morning, and the sun was too high and I was too tired to be sure of my work, so we wearily returned to the hut for breakfast, always keeping a watchful lookout for a kangaroo with his slow hop and deceptive air of dawdling, until you try to keep up with him on a horse or the ungainly emu, whose curiosity regarding anything white that is waved at him quite overcomes his fear of human beings. After a hearty breakfast of eggs and bacon, the two men decided to fish and swim in the enticingly limpid pools in the creek which ran past the hut. Since they had only one fishing rod between them, 
I have a shrewd idea that some of the delicious trout we had for dinner were caught by tickling and not by the legitimate means of the rod. After several days of hard work, I awoke from my after-negation noon siesta to find Ray gazing at a cloud no bigger than a man's hand which was rapidly rising in the blue sky above the hill. It was only the forerunner of others, which became darker and more ominous every minute. We had better get a move on, he said shortly. Bad weather coming and, if we don't get out first, we shall be stuck here for a week. As the provisions were getting low and the prospect of being shut up in the hut with the two men for a week with nothing to do was far from alluring. I heartily agreed. So, we departed in great haste and barely reached the station before the weather broke. I am well aware that the story of my adventure in gold divining ought to end on a happy note, the gold mine was developed and vast quantities of gold were found, and they all lived rich and happy ever after. Alas! things don't happen like that to diviners or prospectors in real life. Our high hopes, and they were high with good reason, were wiped out by a curt note from a departmental pen informing us that snowy plains had been made into a national park in which no mining leases could be granted under any circumnegation stances whatsoever. Down came our glittering golden castle with shattering finality. Nevertheless, once anyone has tasted the intoxication of prospecting for gold, no mountain huts and chilly expeditions at dawn, and no caustic departmental squashings can drive the madness from the blood or keep the gold prospector down for long. Yet in the saner moments of winter, when the bitter wind blows straight from the South Pole and the rain comes down in sheets, the glamour grows a trifle dimmed, and one cannot quite silence the little voice that whispers, the way of the prospector is hard. End of Part 23 Thank you.